Refugees and migrants arrive in countries looking for new lives. How easy is it for them to get jobs? And what impact do they have on local economies? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Welcome to the programme. Starting again in a new country, sometimes with a strange language. Getting a job is an important part of the process. So how can an influx of refugees and migrants change a labour force, indeed a national economy? For better or for worse, or perhaps for both? The Syrian conflict forced millions to flee their homeland and make the perilous journey to safe havens around the world, forming part of the greatest refugee event since the Second World War. It prompted governments worldwide to reconsider their policies toward refugees. There isn't a solution to this problem that's simply about taking people. Deutschland hilft, wo Hilfe geboten ist. We are facing a crisis of epic proportions. What are the long-term effects of an influx of refugees? Are they an economic boon or a financial drag? During the nearly seven years since it began, the Syrian civil war has seen nearly seven million people displaced within the country. Five million others housed within neighboring countries and more than one million more choosing to make their way into Europe dividing the German public and their political leaders on the issue of resettlement. For many, the strength of the German economy was the deciding factor, believing it would make settling there and finding work easier. Was wir jetzt erleben, das ist etwas, was unser Land schon in den nächsten Jahren auch weiter beschäftigen wird, verändern wird. Und wir wollen, dass es sich zum Positiven verändert. Und wir glauben, das können wir schaffen. Angela Merkel faced criticism from Germans who felt their economy and their society would be under strain. And praise from Germans who believed the influx would mitigate a growing labor shortage within the economy. Middle Eastern economies were similarly divided. The government in Jordan has promised to create 200,000 employment opportunities for the approximately 650,000 refugees it's hosting. While in Lebanon, it's estimated as much as one quarter of the country's current population are from neighboring Palestine and Syria. It's very difficult to stay here, you know, we're we can't take even uh, the temporary resident uh, and uh, the work here for Syrians, it's not allowed. The expectation falls on developed nations to accept refugees regardless of the economic implications. But the issue has become deeply politicized, making discourse on the subject hard to unpick. And it could be some time until history bears out the facts. Very pleased to say at the round table we have Jonathan Port as a professor of economics and public policy at King's College in London. We have Zubeda Haq, a research associate and consultant at the Runnymede Trust, which is an independent race equality think tank. Making up the panel, we have Phoebe Griffith, who's the Assistant Director for Migration, Integration and Communities at the Institute for Public Policy Research, which describes itself as a progressive policy think tank. Those long introductions, I ever, I'd just like to say welcome indeed to this round table. Let's talk about perceptions and something that you wrote, Jonathan, in the light of this. There was a survey a couple of years ago by the Global Attitudes Group. And its question was, refugees are a burden on our country because they take our jobs and social benefits. Oh, well, the average of the 10 European countries was 50%. Half of all people questioned felt that to be a correct 
statement. When you've written that economists tend to see an influx of refugees, and your word was influx, um, not as an obligation or a threat, but as an opportunity. So how do you square that one? Um, well, first of all, I think you have to make a distinction between the short and the long term. Right, so the immediate impact of an influx of refugees is obviously a burden on the receiving country. You have to provide houses, health care, schools, etc., etc., um, and it will take refugees a while to become integrated, to become, to get jobs, uh, to become integrated, to, to settle down. You may need to provide language training. So, of course, there's going to be short-term cost, but that should be regarded as an investment. Um, if those integration policies are successful. If refugees are successfully integrated into the society and especially into the labour market, um, then there's plenty of reason to believe that over the long term there'll be an excellent investment for the country. Uh, and, and of and course we've seen that many, many times in history. Yeah, generally does that happen? Um, well, if you look at British history, for example, uh, the Huguenots came here in the uh, 17th and 16th century, right? Um, they of course, they came as refugees. They were a burden. They had to, the, the government had to respond with settlement schedules. But they were integrated. They contributed to the textile industry, um, to the drain, ultimately, to all sorts of uh, uh, economic development in the east of England and London. Subsequently, um, the Jews uh, arrived here in great numbers in the uh, last part of the uh, 19th century, um, and then again, um, and when uh, the Nazis came to power. Mm. Um, Jews, of course, have done extremely well economically. More recently, the East African Asians, there was a very large influx, and this, is, I think, is more relevant because it was hugely unpopular. There was a huge amount of tabloid hysteria about these East African Asians, Indians who... First story I ever covered. Yeah. Well, so these were people who we felt, at a, some sort of political level, we had some moral obligation to, because we'd been responsible for yeah. moving them from India to Africa in the first place. And so Ted Heath, one of the most courageous acts by a British prime minister in the last half century, in my view, said, despite this media tabloid hysteria, we are going to honor our obligations. We're going to take them in. And 40 years later, there's almost universal acceptance that, that, that those refugees have been very successful economically, made a substantial contribution to British society. So why, and either one of you can chip in on this, mm. uh, why do we only remember the bad bits? Are not the good bits. I don't think generally it's... because, of course, you, you you promote the good bits. Mm. I mean, I think uh, the context is very important. I, one of the most uh, disastrous policies we've had in, in the UK has been to disperse asylum seekers to areas of the of the country where there's very low levels of economic opportunity. Now, when you, when you bring in a migrant population into an area where there are not a lot of jobs, when people are struggling, where wages are low, of course, the perception is going to be that they're having a detrimental effect. And actually. In practice, they could be, right? If you are in a context where you're very, very dependent on welfare, for example, and there are more people coming to sort of um, rely on, on, on the state for goods and services, then this will feel sort of much, the competition will come in, in, into the picture. However, if you look at the East End of London, it's a classic example. It's almost a conveyor belt of integration for new communities. And if you arrive in London, you're very, you know, highly likely to find a job pretty quickly. So therefore, yeah. the perceptions of you um, are very, very different, right? You become an economic co contributor very soon. And this has been reflected in public opinion polls again and again. You know, places where there's a sort of long trajectory of receiving migrants, where there's lots of economic opportunity, tend to be much more open-minded. And the converse is true as well. Yeah, you mentioned... Um, tabloid hysteria, but it, it, it's the image. Yes, that's absolutely. I mean, I, I was going to there. say that the problem is, is, is refugee, refugee integration or refugee settlement. None of it happens in a social vacuum. So, a lot of the, a lot of the negative perceptions about what refugees contribute and don't contribute is actually, especially nowadays, carried out in the media. The media are funneling those views about. Um, refugees. Um, I mean, and back in 2013, there was a, a huge study by, by the Migration Observatory looking at um, media articles, 58,000 um, media articles in terms of how they talk about immigrants and immigration. And it was really interesting that the terms they used, you know, it was all around influx and mass. Which is a word I've read out once and which I've quoted yes, absolutely. you as having it, used in one it's, article. It's all those sort of negative words. Yeah. And of course that has a massive subliminal impact. But I think Phoebe makes a very important point, which is about, it's also how we have managed 
refugees. I mean, actually, we know that refugees is what uh, it's about a fifth of a one fifth of one percent of the population. If you include asylum seekers, it's about a quarter of one percent of the population. They're very small in numbers. I mean, nowadays we're only talking about tens of thousands, thirty thousand. <clears throat> 2002, they were about 84. There were about 84,000 refugees coming in. So nowadays it's very small. So actually, when we talk about economic impact, it seems to me partly an absurd thing to talk about because the numbers are so tiny. But where the issue is, is exactly as Phoebe said once again, in terms of austerity, we have we have a population, we have the left behind, the working class black and ethnic minority communities, the working class white communities, who are beleaguered by the austerity cuts. You know, you've got people going to food banks, you've got people, people who are working but still in poverty, children in working families in poverty. And that means that then it does become a zero-sum game to those people. Well, they, they see refugees getting they benefits see and refugees, they think it should be Exactly. Coming. If they're Are going they? to food banks okay. and they see refugees getting a cash card, now it doesn't matter that that cash card is only five pounds a day, but if they see that, you can see how tensions arise. You know, these people feel abandoned, they feel betrayed by the government, and then they see what they think are handouts to refugees that are not... If, if we go stage beyond that in terms of the economics and take a look at the jobs that uh, somebody coming to, let's say, the UK could get. Does that, uh, do they take jobs that nobody else wants or in taking jobs that nobody else wants, do they perhaps incentivise people to become more highly skilled and increase the wealth of those people who are natives, if you like? I, I mean, the, the overwhelming weight of the evidence, both in the UK and in most other countries, is that it all sort of washes out. That is, for every job an immigrant or a refugee takes, another one is created somewhere else. So yes, of course, I mean, if, if a, a, a somebody... Well, that's good for the economy, isn't it? It, it means the economy is, is yeah, bigger. It's growing. Um, it may or may not be good in terms of, of whether it makes us more prosperous. That depends on, on a whole bunch of other things. But the evidence that, that uh, refugees take jobs away from, from or, or immigrants take jobs away from, from natives is pretty small. And I mean, Zubayd is right. Actually, the numbers in the UK are so small, you probably wouldn't even notice if it were true. But when we look at very large refugee influxes, um, the most uh, famous example of this in economics is the Mariel boat lift mm. um, from Cuba to Miami uh, or to Florida in the uh, uh, um, 1980s when uh, um, a very large number of Cubans arrived and an awful lot of them stayed in Miami because they were existing communities. And the impact on job prospects for people who were already there turned out to be basically zero. And you see the same thing with Russian uh, Jewish refugees who arrived in Israel in the 1990s. Again, huge population, a million arriving in a country of five million, didn't take away jobs from native Israelis. Similarly, at the moment we have a lot, you know, we don't have many Syrians in the UK, a few thousand, mm. um, but there are an awful lot of Syrians in Lebanon and Jordan, and though, and Turkey, mm. um, and those have certainly called, those have been a real challenge for those governments, far, far greater than anything our government has, has had to deal with. But again, the studies that look at the impact on the, the job market in Turkey haven't found that Turks have been pushed out of jobs mm. by the fact that Syrians have well, arrived. Well, in fact, that they brought an awful lot of wealth to the country yeah. as well. Let, let, I just mentioned something with the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, points out the differences between a country such as the UK, where it says um, immigrants are only marginally more likely to be unemployed than mm -hmm. natives, and countries such as Spain, Greece, Belgium and Sweden, where it says 10%. Yeah. Now, why, why do we see the differences in I mean, those countries? This is what what the is context, the model? Isn't it? The model is very different. Our labour market is completely different to many of your Euro European labour markets. Um, and I guess it is a trade-off. You know, a migrant arriving in London or in other parts of the UK will find it very easy to find a foothold in the labour market. Um, you know, they will be paid sort of a certain wage, a minimum wage, they're guaranteed that. But, you know, employers find it very easy to hire and to fire. And I think that does have repercussions for the domestic labour force. I mean, inevitably, in certain sectors, you know, employers will go for the easiest option. The default option has become, for in sectors mm. such as construction, to employ migrants, including migrants via agencies who employ people from outside the UK directly. Now, I don't see that making it 
any easier for a UK worker of a certain level of, or a certain skill level to find their, you know, uh, to find a better yeah. job, to find progression, to be have um, investment in their skills, for example, to have security in the labour market. So, I think I I wouldn't assign any causality between migration and the fact that you know workers in Britain, for example, are less secure. But certainly in the current context of a very deregulated migrant um, uh, labour market, mm. where you've had high levels of immigration. You know, certain workers in the UK have felt more vulnerable. Okay, so, so the UK economy is primed, perhaps, in, in many ways to take these people. Yes. Um, are Sweden and Spain, for example, well, exactly. are two different examples of the same issue? Sweden, maybe the labour market is incredibly regulated, mm. and in Spain, unemployment is incredibly high. Is that yeah. a fair reading but, of it? But the other thing about those countries is they have stronger state sectors. So they, I mean, this is one of the issues. One of the issues is we've got because of the decline of manufacturing, because of the rapid change in technology, be, you know, and, and with mining towns being shut down and there was no real replacement, what we had, what we have had is neither Labour nor Conservative governments have really addressed that issue about reskilling, reskilling low skilled people, about filling in those jobs. So when you've got migrants coming in and taking jobs, it's not that they're taking <clears throat> someone else's job necessarily. I mean, I think a lot of the evidence has shown that they're taking jobs that nobody wants. I mean, that's that's part of the issue. The other impact is, is, is in terms of wage. No, the other thing is, but the wages, the wages argument that, that they have lowered wages has also been overinflated. Actually, I think Jonathan's own work has shown that it has a very a very sort of small impact on wages but in a way I think it doesn't matter because it's all about perception but what we've got is this problem that because the governments haven't addressed the rapid change in technology, haven't addressed the fact that low-skilled people need to be reskilled, haven't addressed the fact that the mining towns no longer have mines, that's where the okay. tension arises. Let, let, let's put this one out because um, countries that take immigrants can be highly successful countries. And let's take a look mm -hmm. at the, the United States, for example. If other developed countries say, look, we really don't want this, then they're shooting themselves in the foot because demographically we need the extra mm -hmm. populations that immigrant communities can bring because of higher birth rates among them at the moment, and, and otherwise we're, we're in, a, in a big pickle. Um, I think that argument can often be overstated. I mean, the, U, uh, uh, um, you know, the UK has a growing population, partly as a result of the high migration of the last 20, uh, 20 years or so. Um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 wouldn't say, I, would, I would say that... You don't think um, we need them just for population reasons? Not just for population but reasons, no. I it think helps. That, I think in the UK, yeah, it helps. You know, look, the population is a in the UK is aging. That means that if we want to enjoy a decent retirement, we are over time going to have to work longer and smarter. Or have more uh, people at a younger well, age you in employment that, paying taxes. You can't do that indefinitely. Migration can help smooth the transition and has been important actually in the UK in turning us around from a point where we had a very a well under par fertility rate to one where we're now in rough equilibrium. But I don't think that is the main reason for immigration. There are countries mm -hmm. which really do need immigration for precisely that reason. Can you we, name any? Got, oh, yes, give us some examples. I'm, I'm Southern Europe, for example. I mean, yeah. look, you, if you look at Greece uh, or Portugal or Spain, these are, these are or Italy. Italy has a fertility rate of I don't know 1.3 or 1.4. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. But the UK has a fertility rate of 1.9. Yeah. That's not a disaster, and it's, it's not. But that's still slightly it. dropping, isn't it? Because it's, if two people produce one. Point nine, then eventually o it's, over it's, time. Yes, it's going down. But I, I think one shouldn't overstate the demographic case for migration okay. in so that's one argument especially like because the UK. We've, got high, we've got a relatively high proportion of ethnic minorities compared to some of the other countries, yeah. and so you know even if you if you look at the Muslim population, they are on average very young, and with half the po Muslim population are under twenty five. Mm. So th I mean that that will have an impact. We don't, as Jonathan says, need more more immigrants for that very reason but I think the other thing is is one of the things we're confusing at the moment is immigrants versus refugees and I think we I do need I, I, to be a bit more careful in terms of okay. the impact the differential mm. impact but eventually, the differential economic contribution right. mm, so eventually on. if I could put this out there because we had this discussion before the program didn't we uh, eventually whether you're an 
refugee or a migrant, you become a new member of that country's population. So yeah. we have to talk about new, let's call it new arrivals. But the problem is the public, the public don't distinguish between a refugee and a, uh, and a EU, be it black and ethnic minority migrant and um, a migrant from the non-EU. If they all look the same colour, if they all are black and ethnic minority, the public doesn't know. How would you know who a refugee is and who an economic migrant is, or who's joined their husband or wife under the family re under the family reun reunification scheme? What do you do about um, the suggestion that countries should be able to pick and choose? Um, because in Canada, I think they're saying highly skilled workers absolutely come this way, whereas in fact the vast majority of people who are ref refugees, not all of them, of course, um, are. They, they have low-skilled jobs to some extent. They'd be bombed out of their mm -hmm. homes. They don't have many possessions, etc. They are not going to come with um, I mean, I a think, dowry, if you like. I think certainly in terms of managing public opinion, pick and choosing has been fundamental to mm -hmm. the fact that you know countries like Canada do have a very bright, widespread consensus around immigration. You know, you have a political program around it that has high levels of public support, and that is not what we have in the UK. We is that because they're, they're taking the best of the best? Well, no, they're just no. Be making a very, very, a, a case for immigration on yeah. fundamentals and economics, basically. And they will take us, you know, they take a spread. They, there are controversial aspects to their refugee policy in particular. Yeah. They're highly selective around refugees. They select yeah. refugees on the basis of their skill levels, on the basis of their likelihood of being reliant on the health system. So that is controversial, but, but, but it's very, it has lessened. been very fundamental to the fact that Canada has a very different debate mm. around immigration uh, than we do in, in, in Europe. I mean, on the point of selectivity, the problem is that it's kind of difficult, right? And it tends to be the people with the loudest voices that get the most migrants. So, you know, post-Brexit, for example, I have no doubt that the financial services um, uh, sector, for example, in London, will have an ability to recruit internationally and will continue recruiting from Europe. It will be the sectors which are much lower down the pay scale, which are, for example, outside London, which will struggle to kind of play a role in that system. And that's, I think, one of the issues around selectivity. Mm. That's but, kind of quite but also the, the notion that you can pick and choose, I think, is overstated as well. Exactly. I mean, to what extent can you pick and choose? Even with no, refugees, exactly. we've got changing refugees from 20 years ago. I mean, if they're fleeing for, for war and persecution reasons like in Afghanistan, like in Syria, actually we're less able to be selective on that basis because we can't really kick them back out. So even though there's a high refusal rate, mm. we're, we're not able to choose with refugees. And of course, even with the other, even with the other migrants, you have to think about whether they're non-EU or EU and what kind of skills they bring. Th th I think that's the thing. Th there is, it's just like the numbers game, just like when the government says we'll be able to bring the numbers down to 100,000. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think the, pick, the, the pick and choose thing is really illustrated by what's happened. People voted in the Brexit referendum because they thought, oh, you know, it's not that we don't want any European migrants. We want mm -hmm. to be able to pick, you know, we don't want to have, to have to have them all. Um, we want to be able to pick and choose. So, of course, we'll still have um, bankers and nurses. Doctors, yeah. So we vote and what happens? Um, EU nurses who are here and some who are thinking of coming say, oh, not sure I want to come to this country anymore because they decide they want, don't want to be part of Europe and I'm not sure what's we're welcome. So they, even so even before we are in a position to pick and choose, because of course we can't yeah. get, we're so, the, it's actually the Europeans who are picking and choosing and are saying, actually, we're not so sure we want to come to the UK anymore. Let's go so back to the early... Picking and choosing goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's also notable that actually, despite the fact that the UK has a much less selective system that in some respects than, say, Australia, actually the average skill level of, of, of migrants to the UK is quite similar to that uh, of Australians. And that's because the UK has, at least up till now, been a relative, at least up to the last few years, been a relatively attractive place for skilled migrants for all the reasons that we know. The should, should, English speaking, we, London, all the rest of it. We're coming to the end of the programme. It's, it's, it's zipped past, but I want to go back in time to see if things have changed for the better to some extent. Um, 1981, there was an international conference on assistance for refugees in Africa, which largely described them as a burden. Do you think views have changed? Not um, necessarily Africa, but I mean, 
Well, I, I think the problem... In the chattering I, classes. I, I, what, what, what people on the right would say is actually views have changed and, and, and that the public think of, of um, immigrants as, as more of a burden. But we have to try and unpack that a little because even if polls are saying, yes, you know, more of the public think they're more of a burden, and actually that needs to be nuanced, depends what question you ask about immigrants. The reality is, is we, have to t we have to look at the role of the media in this. The media, as I've said before, they have played a massive role in spreading pernicious rumours and lies about immigrants. And that has had an impact on not only everybody's use, choice of words when they describe immigrants, mm. but also how they perceive immigrants. And so in that sense, that's been a vicious circle. That's been a vicious circle that has definitely made the perception and treatment of immigrants much worse. Maybe? I mean, I'd say a few things have changed a lot. I think attitudes towards race have changed fundamentally since 1981. I think also our understanding of the impact of immigration has changed fundamentally. I mean, we have you know experts like Jonathan who've really crunched some numbers, and we know that the evidence is mixed, but on the whole, positive. I mean, in terms of the media, I think it changes, I, and I think there is a, psych, a, a sort of a, a kind of a frenzy that happens when there's high levels of immigration. But actually, you know, what we see now is it's plateaued in the UK. We're having more of a discussion around, yeah. you know, how we manage numbers in the future. So, you know. I don't think it, it, it is a kind of stable thing. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Zubeda and Phoebe, thank you too very much for coming on to this conversation about the, the attitudes and status, not necessarily in terms of uh, where they stand as uh, immigrants or, or refugees, but the status in terms of public perception about those people who try to make their homes in new countries for whatever reasons. Thank you for watching Roundtable. I'm David Foster. It's a team effort. We hope you're there for us next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>